elders in this church, amen? And they're over there smiling. I'd like the elders to just stand up for a minute here. Because I want you to see what we see. an example of how great they are in their prayer lives to God. You know, recently the elders were on a camping trip together. And uh, in the campsite wandered a large, ferocious grizzly bear. And old John kind of peeked on out of the tent and he noticed the grizzly bear and he ducked back in and he, he shook around, run, 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 there's a grizzly bear in the camp. What should we do? I don't know. I, I wish Linda was here. Maybe she could tell us what to do. But nevertheless, they decided, hey, listen, the bear's coming over here. We've got to get out of here. And so they darted out of the tent. And John leading the way, running out of the tent, running through the woods with Ron right on his tail. And they started out flying through the woods, and the bear darted out after them. just began to tire and the bear started gaining ground and they're running and the bear's getting closer and closer and closer and they're trying to run faster and faster and faster and then all of a sudden Ron just falls to the ground and exhausted. Being the spiritual man that he is, he decided that this is a great time to call him God. And so Ron began to pray, God, please let this be a Christian bear. God, please let this be a Christian bear. Please, God, please, please, please. And then all of a sudden, the bear gets right on top of Ron. And then there's a brief silence. The bear looks you over. Father, thank you for this food I'm about to receive. From the rest of the gave birth to a baby girl by the name of Sophia. The 
the Dora. Which means wisdom of God's gift. Amen to Angelo and Susan. Well, I do have a message for you today. And I want you to know that your hard work in the Lord is not in vain. Your perseverance through trials and through troubles are not in vain in the Christian life. Your battling, your wrestling, your perseverance with sin in this life is not in vain. Your sacrifice financially and otherwise to see the gospel taken around the world is not in vain. relationships with each other as we learn how to be totally united in the Lord are not in vain. And all of the other challenges that we face as disciples in this movement are not in vain. And the reason it's not in vain today is because Jesus is coming back. It's not in vain today because there's going to be a great homecoming. Is coming back. Turn on your Bibles over to John 14. I hope you're ready to hear the message preached today. I'm not up here to give you a bunch of philosophy. I just want to hold out the Word of God in your presence. In John chapter 14, let's begin reading here in verse 1. He tells his disciples, do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me, in my Father's house, are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you so. I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go up and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way. Jesus in this passage pulls all of the disciples together. It's a very trying time in the movement of God. As Peter, in just a few verses earlier, is told for the first time, listen, you're going to betray me. After all, he was one of Jesus' very best friends. Peter, you're going to deny me and betray that you even know my name. Not only that, he also announces for the first time that Judas, the treasurer, one of the leaders among the group, would also betray him in a way that had never been done before. He would hand Jesus over to be crucified. But not only that, Jesus also makes him aware, listen guys, I'm about to leave. But in a very encouraging day of Peter, you're going to deny me. Judas, you're going to betray me. And oh, by the way, guys, I'm leaving you. You didn't read that, though. He says, well, let me tell you something. Don't let your hearts be Because in my father's house are many rooms. You see, Jesus here begins to talk to them about heaven. Jesus has spent 33 years here on foreign soil. And he begins to speak to them about heaven with incredible familiarity. And he says, listen, in my Father's house are many rooms. I'm going there to spare. You know, it's not strange that Jesus talks about heaven because it's not familiarity. You see, because heaven is Jesus' his hometown. He lived there. He says, let me tell you something. I'm going to come back. How many of you have seen Terminator 2? Awesome movie, right? But let me tell you something. Let me let it be said here first. Jesus said it before Arnold did. He said, I'll be back. 
amazing what you can find in the Word, isn't it? The title of our lesson today is very simply, I'll be back. 2 Peter chapter 3. Well, Jesus, when are you going to come back? 2 Peter chapter 3. You know, I'm going to talk about the second coming today because I think we need to be inspired by Jesus coming back to us. In 2 Peter chapter 3, we're going to look at a lot of scripture today, so be ready. Look on down in verse 3. First of all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, where is this coming? He has promised. Ever since our fathers died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. But they deliberately forget that long ago, by God's word, the heavens existed, and the earth was formed out of water and by water. By these waters also, the world of that time was deluged and destroyed. By the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly people. Do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. But that day, but the day of the Lord, will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear from the world. The elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth and everything in it everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people are you? That is a good question. He says, listen, the earth is being held to be judged. You know, the Bible doesn't tell us specifically when the Lord is coming back. It doesn't tell us what hour or what second or what week or what month. It just simply says he's coming. It says that people will be saying on that day, where is he coming? You know, he's been saying he's going to come for a long time. Where is he? You see, even up until the very end, people will still doubt whether the Lord is coming back or not. The very second that Jesus is preparing to come back, people will say, there is no God, there is no coming, it'll never happen. You see, there always will be skeptics. But he says, hey, don't you forget one thing, church. He came before. Don't forget that long ago, Noah built an ark, and the rains came from the heaven, and the Lord came. He says that in Matthew 24. You see, it's going to be a normal day, the day the Lord comes back. There's not going to be anything spectacular about that day. You'll wake up, and the sun will come up just as it always does. It'll be hot, perhaps, like it's been all summer long. It'll just be a normal day. People will get up, have their breakfast, get in their cars, go off to work. The taxi drivers in Chicago will be running you off the road. People will be planning their weddings, making plans for the weekend. Before. But it's no fun being robbed, is it? 
They're so incredible. My wife and my little boy decided to take some time and go to the Lincoln Park Zoo. And we parked our car, and I was getting out of the car, and I closed the door, and I got my wife and my son out, and we started walking up to the park, and my wife noticed that my wallet was kind of sticking halfway out of my pocket. And she says, honey, you need to give me your wallet before someone steals it from you. And I'm like, I know how to take care of my wallet, honey. You know, pride set in. I know how to take care of my wallet, honey. You know, I started being macho. First pride comes and then macho wisdom comes. I'm like, just let somebody try and take my wallet, okay? You know, of all places, the children sue. So we walked on through the, the portion of the zoo that's uh, reserved primarily for farm animals, and we went in. There was a pig there that had just given birth to, what do you call baby pig? Piglets? And so we went in to see the little piglets, and my wife was so fired up, and this couple walked in, and my wife noticed them. She said, boy, what, what a strange-looking couple, and, and you would have to be there, okay, to understand what she meant, but they were definitely strange-looking. And we were all into the pigs, and the girl in the couple walks over, oh, man, can you believe these pigs? I mean, check this out. I mean, she's going up, so the pigs are like, what's the big deal? They're just pigs. But she was strange. my wallet anymore. It's in her purse now. But they caught me off guard. The element of surprise. You know, you don't have to worry today about walking out of the Medina and someone coming up to you and saying, uh, do your fellowship, excuse me, uh, I, I want you to know something. About 10 minutes after you fellowship, I'd like you to meet me around the corner and, and turn around so that I can rob you. You know, the guy didn't send me a postcard with a pig on it saying, listen, while you're at the children's zoo, I'm going to get your wallet. You see, he's going to come like a thief when you least expect it. The element of surprise will be there. It'll catch you off guard. Why? again and I'm here to tell you today not only has it happened but it will also happen again first Corinthians chapter 15 verse 52 you don't have to turn it the Bible says he will come in a flash in the twinkling of an eye surprise can't the Lord just tell us when he's going to come and then we'll all be ready? He's already told you that he's coming. Why not just be ready anyway? You see, God is not limited by time. God stands outside of time and is absolutely still. We serve a God who's multidimensional in every way. He's not limited by time. God looks at time from an eternal perspective. He looks at all of time, not just a brief. So, the most opportune time when the most people ever can be saved. You see, he's patient with us. Not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Listen, that means you, and that means me. Hasn't God been so patient? I look at the patience of God in my life, and I'm literally blown away. 
I look at all the times when I allowed sin to harbor in my heart, all the times I had bad attitudes, all the times that I wasn't fired up for God. And then I see all the times God kept loving me. You know what that does for me? It inspires me. It inspires me to make changes in my life. And I want to challenge the Chicago church today. Today needs to be a day of change. A day when we give our whole heart to God. A day when we're totally committed. Because he's coming back. What's the answer? Well, the answer is simply this. Choose God. Choose to be ready. Well, how will he come? Look on over in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. How will the Lord come back? In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16. Are you with me? Verse 16, it says, For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command and with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise. Then after that, we who are still alive and our left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to beat the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. The Bible says here that the Lord himself will come. He will not be sending a Domino's pizza man on that day. He's going to come himself. He's going to come down through the clouds, and the clouds are going to part open, and Jesus is going to come down to the earth. In Matthew 24, verse 27, the Bible says it will be visible to all. It will be a public coming. Then in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 7, the Bible says, Every eye will see him, even those that pierced him. You're going to see it. The Bible says that every eye, you know, there'll be a lot of eyes that won't want to see the Lord. But you're going to have to see it anyway, because it will be a public coming, and it will be evident to all. Now, I don't know exactly how he's going to come through the cloud. I don't know if he's going to just stick his foot through there first or what he's going to do. I don't know if we'll see an earlobe here in Chicago and then over in uh, South Africa somewhere they'll see an elbow. I don't know how he's going to come through. Personally, I just would rather see all of it. And that may be the way he, he will come. We may see all of the Lord at once. It'll be a day of mixed responses. To some, it will be a day after they work, over, work through the fear of seeing somebody come through a cloud. For some, it will be a day of incredible joy. For others, it will be a day of incredible pain. It will be a day of tremendous regret. But let there be no doubt there will be mixed responses. The Bible says that he will come with a loud trumpet call. And those who are died in Christ will be raised first. You know, that's exciting news. That the Lord will put on a jazz concert for us. And then all the dead people are going to rise up, boogie down. You know, they're not going to rise as zombies. You know, they're not going to come out of the tomb like dawn of the living dead. They're going to come out with a new body. A glorious body. In fact, in 1 Corinthians, the Bible says that their bodies will be immortal. Imperishable. 
That's the way to come out of the ground. You know, that encourages me because my nose has been a little oversized all my life. And I look forward to having a new nose. And there are some of you out there with those pointy ears. Well, you don't have to spend eternity with those. You're going to get a new body. All those aches and all that disfiguration, that thinning hair. I know, I'm getting sensitive now, right? You'll get a new body. Verse 17, the Bible says, after the dead are rising, those of us who are in the Lord on earth will be called up into the air. You know, if it happened today, we just rise right on up to the Medina. But you know, he says, listen, they'll be called up into the air, and you know what will happen then? There's going to be a great fellowship. Those disciples that were killed in the train accident over in Toronto recently, they'll be there. The brother that died out on the beach last year in the Lakeshore sector, he'll be there. The brother that died in the southeast as he had just left the Bible talk and was murdered, will be there. That brother, that sister that's sitting next to you out there, and we'll fellowship. And can you imagine what the fellowship is going to be like on that day? We're flying through the air. You know, I can just see old Scott turning. It's going to be incredible to talk about the victories that we had here on earth. We'll be so excited when we look over and we see that neighbor that we reached out to going up there with us. We'll see our children going up there with us. There'll be a tremendous fellowship. Then something else will happen. It's found over in Revelation 20, verse 5. You don't have to turn there, but the Bible says then the rest of the people will come after that. And so the disciples will go on up first and then all of the rest of the world will also go up to meet God. Well, what will happen to the earth? Look over Second Peter. You know, you need to know this stuff, amen? Second Peter, chapter 3. Verse 10, it says, but the Lord will come like a thief, the heavens will disappear with the roar, and the elements will be destroyed by fire. The Bible says here that the heavens, and it's referring here to the sky itself, will literally disappear. Now, turn over to Revelation chapter 6. Do you like the book of Revelation? Do you understand the book of Revelations? Let me tell you how you can understand the book of Revelations. I'll never forget this. I went back home about four or five years ago, and my wife and I studied with my mom, and she became a Christian. And about three days later, she got up and was sitting at the kitchen table studying her Bible. And I went down and said, you know, Mom, what are you studying? She says, I'm studying the book of Revelations. I'm like, wow, that's pretty needy for a baby Christian. I said, well, Mom, do you understand the book of Revelation? Oh, of course, yes. The book of Revelation is really easy to understand. I said, well, I, I don't even understand all the book of Revelation. Can you tell me what it means? Well, what does it mean? She said this. It means Jesus. You see, that's all you need to know about the book of Revelation. Is that Jesus won? Amen? Okay, let's go on over there. Revelation chapter 6. Look down at verse 14. It says, The sky receded like a scroll rolling up, and every mountain and island was removed from its place. 
What's going to happen to the sky? The Bible says it's going to roll up and disappear. You know, in the home that we just moved from, uh, down here in the High Park area, we had these large shades over our window. And one night we had a blackout in the house, and, and I wasn't sure if it was the entire community or if it was just our house. And so I went over, and we had these shades, and I pulled the shade down, and it flipped up really, really fast. And I looked out. Bible says that's what's going to happen to the sky. God's going to take the sky and give it a little change. And it's going to pull up. Look up in Revelation 6, verse 12. I watched as he opened the sixth seal. There was a great earthquake. The sun turned black like sackcloth made of goat's hair. The whole moon turned blood red and the stars in the sky fell to the earth as late figs drop from a big tree, shaken by strong. He said the elements will be destroyed by fire. The sun will get so hot, and then it'll cool off and turn into a big ball of black. The stars in the sky will fall to the earth like scorched leaves. Of course, you know, during the changing of seasons from, uh, from the spring or from the summer to the fall and, and how the leaves just crumble up. He says the stars will be like that. And they'll crumble up. house you live in, forget about the mortgage payments on that day. That apartment building you live in, it'll be turned to rubble. That condo, you won't need that anymore. That office building that you so frantically run out of your house to every morning because we're always running late for work, right? We'll literally be destroyed. Students, no more classes! That sports car you've always wanted, I don't even have to say it, right? That mink coat, be too hot to wear it on that day. Those Bulls tickets. Game canceled due to bad weather. Look on down in verse 15. Then the kings of the earth, the princes, the generals, the rich, the mighty, and every slave and every free man will hide in caves and among the rocks of the mountains. They will call to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come, and who can stand? He's coming back! And if you're not right with God, it'll be the most frightening day of your life. He says you'll be so scared that you'll beg the mountains to literally fall on you. Stand before God. 
I'm here to tell you today it's time to get humble. It's time to get ready for Jesus to come back. Well, what will happen to the people? Look over Matthew 25. Matthew 25. Verse 32. You see, because now people will prepare for the judgments. And in verse 32, the Bible says, All the nations will be gathered before him. And he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. After that happens, then the Bible says that crowds of people will gather together. Every person that has ever lived from Adam and Eve to the Tunisis new baby. And every person that has ever lived and that will ever live in the future will gather together before the Lord. Involved in that crowd will be people from every nation under heaven. The Latins will be there. The Asian people will be there. French people will be there. The Russians will be there. The Arabs will be there. Americans will be there. Africans will be there. Canadians will be there. Jews will be there. Every nation under heaven will be gathered before God. There won't be any racism on that day. We'll all be alike. It won't matter if you're black or white or red or green or any other color that you choose to be. Because we'll all be alike before God. Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20. Ron told me I could speak for an hour. I've used up about 15 minutes so far. Revelation chapter 20. Look on down in verse 12. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it. Earth and sky fled from its presence, and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the book. He says here that great and small alike will be gathered before God. Rich and poor will be there. Kings and queens will be there. Donald Trump will be in this crowd. Michael Jordan will be in this crowd. President Bush will be in this crowd. Ronald Reagan will be in this crowd. Saddam Hussein will be in this crowd. <laughs> the homeless will be in this crowd. Kooky Stevens will be in this crowd. Kooky was a practical joker in high school. Your high school teacher will be in this crowd. Please don't say amen to that. Every person in this auditorium will be in this crowd. 
And then something else will happen in Romans chapter 14. Romans chapter 14. Look on down in verse 11. The Bible says it is written, As surely as I live, says the Lord, Every knee will bow before me. Every tongue will confess to God. So then, each of us will give an account of God himself. What will happen next? We must come before God. Every one of us. You'll be able to hear a pin drop at this point. It'll be so quiet. It says, number one, that we must bow down. All those people that, said, that we've studied with that said, hey, I'll, I'll never bow down to Jesus. Oh, they will bow. You can bow now, or you can bow later. But you will bow! Kind of like the Midas commercial, isn't it? He says you'll bow down. And not only will you bow down, but you'll give an account. There'll be two types of people there. Just two. There'll be the disciple who was ready. And there'll be the non-disciple who made excuses. The disciple will go before the Lord first. And you can imagine what it'll be like. And I don't think any of us are going to just, okay, here I am, God. I think we'll... And then we'll go up before God. And we'll bow down. And we'll begin to give an account. Lord, I know for the first 20 years of my life I didn't follow you. I was immoral. I was critical. I was negative. I was a drunkard. I did drugs. I watched pornography. I sinned it up, God. I humbly confess that before you. But then, God, you brought a disciple into my life. And I know I, I wasn't totally open at first. You know, I kind of looked at this guy. Well, who is this guy? You're, you're strange. And I know I criticized him for being so committed, but thank you, Lord, that you let him hang in there with me. And then, God, you know, after studying for about six weeks, I was baptized. Of course, that was the greatest day of my life. And then, God, I was so fired up, I started studying the Bible with people and converting people in my dorm and in my neighborhood. And of course, God, there are lots of people that are going to come up after me that I personally won to Christ. And it was so good being fruitful for you. Thank you for opening up their hearts, God. And then, God, you gave me Mary Lou. I know I was tempted, God, to date non-Christians, but I held on. And Mary Lou was the greatest thing that has ever happened to me since Jesus. She was so beautiful, and God, I don't know why you gave her to me, but thank you. And we dated, and we kept that relationship pure. We got married, and I would love to tell you about that first night, but I won't, God. It was awesome. And we had little Johnny. We raised him up in the Lord. 
The children's program in the Chicago church was so awesome and helped so much. Of course, at 15, he was baptized into Christ. We gave him back to you, Lord, and he went full-time into the ministry, and of course, he's leading the work over in Europe now. Vision, amen. And then, Lord, as we continue to grow older in our faith, you made us elders in the church, and we served you with all of our hearts. And here we are now. You know, that needs to describe every one of us. But then there'll be another type of person that will come before God. The person who made excuses. Well, Lord, I remember going out to that church, but they were so radical. And there were all those newspaper articles about that church. How could I know? And then God will say, you should have noticed the love that they had one for another. And God, I, I know I turned away and I didn't obey and I didn't listen. I know I was incredibly immoral and I lived with Sally for three years of my life. But then we got married, God. Doesn't that count for anything? Oh, I know I was unfaithful to her. But I'm weak. Oh, the divorce, yeah. Well, God, three-fourths of everybody that gets married gets divorced. I gave her the kids. Oh, that was my responsibility too, huh? Well, I just thought you'd give me enough time to respond, God. I didn't think you'd come before I was ready. How about a little mercy now? And the Lord will say, away from me, you evil do. There's some of you in the audience today that if Jesus came back, you would not be ready. And I want to challenge you today to study the Word of God, to open your heart, to let your heart be disciple, to put down your guard and let Jesus become Lord of your life. Amen. But also in this group will be a group of people that at one time were disciples, but that fell away. And you have a lot of excuses too. The Bible says of you that the darkest chambers of hell are reserved for you. Look over in Jeremiah chapter 2. I want to challenge us in the church to begin living our Christian lives as if today were our very last day. I think we play around too much with our souls. I think we're too ungrateful. I think we're too lethargic with the souls that God has given us. Here in Jeremiah chapter 2, the Bible says, The word of the Lord came to me. Go and proclaim in the hearing of Jerusalem. I remember the devotion of your youth. How as a bride, you loved me and followed me through the desert, through a land not sown. Israel was holy to the Lord, the first fruits of his harvest. The Bible says that God takes a lot of pride in us when we're faithful. It says, listen, I remember 
when just as a baby in the Lord, you were so fired up. You didn't need a song to get you ready to praise me. You came in ready. I remember as a bride, how you were so committed to me. You would go with me through the desert. I remember as a bride, how you would follow me into a land that had not been sown. What happened? You know, for so many of us, we have to have all the answers. We have to have everything laid out before we just give our hearts to God. I remember when I first became a Christian. That was about 11 years ago. It was so awesome. I remember all the pain in my life just before I made Jesus Lord. And I remember those first few seconds after I came up out of the water, I was so fired up. I so inspired anything, change anything. The world didn't matter to me anymore. All that mattered was that Jesus was Lord. And that's true for you too, isn't it? What happened? It's so incredible. We had a couple of sisters baptized in the uh, South Sector this past week. And uh, I was in my office and we baptized them in the bathtub say in the bathtub hey, who cares where you get baptized as long as you get baptized amen if it's big enough do it and so we baptized them in the bathtub and they were in there afterwards you know getting their hair together and I just overheard a conversation I heard one of the girls saying man I can't believe this it is so awesome to be in the kingdom of God because for so long I was so deceived and I went to this church and I did this and I did this and I did this and I didn't even know I was lost. But I'm so mad that I was so deceived. How could it happen to me? And then she said, but now. And you know how these sisters are when they get fired up. But now. But now. I know I'm saved. And I just chuckled in the background and said, hey, man. What happened? What happened to the devotion of your youth? Look on in verse 5. This is what the Lord says. What fault did your fathers find in me that they strayed so far from me? See, when we're not doing well in the Lord, God takes it personally. What fault have you found in me that you've allowed yourself to stray away? What have I done? Have I not loved you enough? Have I not given to you enough? What have I done? You know, it's so easy to stray away in our hearts. It's so easy to give in to the world. And I know in my own life, man, I, I just had to do some soul searching recently. Because I saw that, man, I'm not as fired up about God as I used to be. And I thought, well, maybe I just need a vacation. Well, maybe I need to just step back and, and get, no, no, no. I need to give God my heart again. And I remember one night just staying up and praying and studying my scriptures and begging God to give me the fire back. Give me the devotion of my youth. Take away all the things, Lord, that I, I worry about. 
All the things that distract me, just take them away. All I want to care about is you. Oh, there are people that have hurt me, but help me to love them, God. Oh, there are people that have misguided me and misdirected me. God, just help me love them. I just want to be devoted to you. I really appreciated the sermon Ron gave last week. Because there was a time in my life two years ago, three years ago actually, that I was literally devastated in a relationship with another brother. It hurt. Part of it was his fault, but also part of it was my fault as well. But all I could see was him. He did this and this and this and this and this. And then it dawned on me one day. Why am I allowing this guy to still hurt me? Why don't I just take responsibility for me? Why should I let what someone has done to me paralyze me anymore? It was incredible how I was really able to be forgiven there. But not only that, I was also able to really see where I had sinned as well. Don't stray away from the Lord. Go back to the devotion of your youth. Why? Because Jesus is coming back. You need a fresh devotion. You need that boldness that you once had. Look back over in uh, First Peter, Second Peter. I'm sorry, chapter three. The question was raised by the great apostle here in verse 11. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives. As you look forward to the day of God, and speed its coming. That day will bring about the destructions of the heavens by fire, and the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with this promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth, the home of the righteous. So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. Since Jesus is coming back, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to be holy. You ought to be the most spiritual people in all of Chicago. I believe right now in this church and in this city, Satan is mounting one of the most severe challenges to our spirituality ever. I believe Satan is trying to get us to be more and more like the world than ever before. What kind of people are you to be? You ought to be holy. You ought to be different. People ought to notice that you're spiritual. And then you ought to look forward to Jesus coming back. You know, many his, biblical historians believe that Paul was deeply convicted that in his lifetime, the Lord would come back. And I believe that was one of the things that inspired and motivated him to do the things that he did that we read about in the first century. I believe that spirit was also in our first century brothers and sisters. Why are we able to look at them and see them and, and be in awe of their faith, of their conviction, of their passion? I believe because they were looking for Jesus. And then finally in Revelations 21, we'll close with this passage. I'm excited to be a disciple. How about you? Revelations 21. Because it doesn't just end there. Praise God, right? 
Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men. And he will live with them, and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away, and the Chicago church said, Amen. Amen.